My journey sort of started going into college, um, and I remember taking an economics class. Right now, the class itself was garbage. It wasn't wasn't you know it's typical um, <laughs> Keynesianism, if you will, and. I wanted to look, I just looked up stuff, you know, I wanted to become more knowledgeable on economics, right? So it sent me down this rabbit hole and, uh, and I wanted to, I was still stuck in my like, this collectivist sort of box, right? Wanted to learn about the, the black economists, that's, that's who I wanted to hear it from, right? And then I stumbled across the likes of Walter E. Williams and Dr. Thomas Sowell. And it changed, a lot A lot changed, because they were breaking it down, not only for the common man to understand, but certainly, and I think that's absolutely unique to, to Sol does it well as well, but certainly unique to Walter Williams, is that he's able to, some of the issues that, you know, black America, that they gripe about, right? He's able to sort of place that, the blame where it should be. And the, what I love so much about him is that he was holding the individuals accountable within these communities, but also recognizing the fact that there are governments and, and, and their policies that quite often people such as you know, Democrats, which is what almost exclusively what black people tend to support, what they are advocates of seems to be what really is destroying a lot of these communities. Whether it be the minimum wage loss, whether it be um, the welfare statism, and, and all of those things in combination incentivizing a lot of people to fail like it's not it's not simply a one of those yes historically speaking you can look at the um whether it be jim crow laws black codes slave codes all of those and you can look at those and yes those are terrible things but suddenly once those were eliminated and where we're at now you can't really blame a lot of that stuff right but Certainly, when a lot of that started to turn, you look at the Civil Rights Act, um, really on down, and you look at some of those things those started pr to promote. Um, and again, the same, around that same time, the welfare state is replacing the father in those households. It got ugly, and it got ugly fast, and, and you know, broken down families and all, yada yada. That's where we're at now. So most definitely, it made a lot of sense for me personally to go with uh, to to hear it from those guys. And then obviously I sent you down that rabbit hole, right? You go Walter Williams and, you know, you want to find out about, you know, where he's coming from. And then you got the Hayek's of the world. So I wanted to know about uh, more Austrian economists and Rothbard. That was the, that was the ultimate, like, whoosh, like when you hear about Rothbard, you, it doesn't, you can read the anatomy of the estate and it's like, okay, I get it now, you know, for sure. He breaks it down like that. So I thoroughly... Uh, well, I just went down that, that rabbit hole, right? One thing led to another Austrian, Chicago economist. It just one thing led to another, and it just made sense. That's really the most important thing, that libertarianism just, it just made sense. Yes, we did uh, just recently record our uh, second album. Doesn't quite have a name yet, but, you know, this, you know, we hit them over the head with the same similar concept, but we're getting a little more flexible in terms of our artistry the the that was our first album veracity um and it was it was a hit i would have never imagined that it would have got big as it did but now we're going to be a lot more art you know we ha we all come from different backgrounds and we want to make sure we express that so we've already pretty much announced that it will be sort of this like double-sided type of type of deal we had 18 tracks on the first album, this upcoming album is gonna have on roughly like 20 and stuff like that. So we're gonna, between our first two albums, I'll put out, we're gonna put out more music than, you know, people that have three albums out, you know, three, four albums. But uh, this time we're trying to just get a little more, you know, just, just mix it up a little bit. Um, and I, I love it. I love the process. And also obviously with us being able to talk about whatever we talk about, because we don't have any strings attached to us, right? It, it, it's a lovely thing. Ooh, man, uh, I have a mixtape that'll be coming out soon, and actually the mixtape will come out before the album, and uh, that'll be along the lines of some of the the stuff that I know a lot of people want, because it's weird, man. It's funny, because 
Obviously, I get a lot of enjoyment out of performing metal, but I get so many people that ask that ask me the question, man, like what's the hip? Because they 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 love to hear me rap. You know what I mean? And I think I I, I underestimate that quite often. Because even at you know, at an Acapulco, it's a bunch of people saying, hey, where's the where's the rap stuff? You know, we love you. You're a good rapper. We want to hear a lot more of that. So most definitely, I'm going to start bringing and even with the album with the with the with the backwards album you're gonna see a lot of like a lot of that i won't give it too much away but you're gonna see a lot of that that sort of hip-hop stuff but i will be dropping mixtapes and stuff along the way to to give that to people because i know that's something that they want to hear and uh, yeah I, I still enjoy it i may not enjoy it as much as performing the metal stuff but it, I, I do I, I'm, a, I'm a wordsmith man I, I love i love to rap and this is what i grew up doing and if that's what people want to hear i, I want to give it to them for sure Oh, most definitely, man. Uh, some of my favorite uh, fellow, like definitely on the, on the metal side, you know, Ryan, for example, from Fit for a King. I put him on blast because he's open. He's an open um, libertarian, and you know, he's always talking about how he's looking. You know, looked at my post. He's referenced my work and stuff like that. So, uh, and it's a, a guys along the way because we go on these tours. Obviously, a lot of these bands, they aren't libertarians. But they want to hear more about it. They're like, man, I heard what you got, what you saying, man. Well, what's all this? What's all this stuff about? And so I might, I might talk to the drummer or something like that. And you know, we go down. He's like, oh man, it starts to make sense. So even if it doesn't click and they don't adopt libertarianism on the spot, I, I'm very confident in this idea that somewhere down the line, these guys are starting to get. It. There's a lot of closet, definitely in metalcore, even though it seems to be a lot, a really leftist dominated sort of subgenre. There's a lot of closeted libertarians in it because they're like well if i if i come out and say some of that man that's basically the end of their career and this is why i think they're so attracted to to, to us and why you know i talk about it all the time about the void that we just simply feel um and, and just being well, us and people will come up to us like man you make music that i enjoy but man you adopt a philosophy that i adopt and that's what takes it to another level and again there's people in these bands that are kind of closeted but again it's like they don't think that it's worth putting themselves out there like that just simply because yeah you get a target on your back you get a target on your back because it's against the norm in the industry well i would say that it, i don't think that those are necessarily diametrically opposed like you can utilize culture i think and and be political. I think Ron Paul probably was the only person that was successful really in, in doing that. But my thing is, and what, what I, why I'm always like, hey, I'm, I am apolitical. I don't necessarily, you know, vote or anything like that. Because what I look at, I look at, you know, voting or, or more so participating in the political process, um, not necessarily just voting, but participating in the political process. I think that certainly in this day and age, it's, 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 a, it's a losing game, right? Because there's so many people that adopt this, this hardcore statism, right? And they're going to adopt that so as long as that's what, they, what they're presented with. So I think that we need more artists. I think that we need more Joe Blow people that these folks can relate to, man. People that these guys can, can feel like they're authentic, right? And then by default, the politics change. You know, that's on the politics on the downstream, you know what I mean? And and that's what I mean by, all right, well, I want to use culture. So use the things that I'm, I already know I relate to these individuals with, and I do that to sort of plant those seeds, right? We have that common interest. Uh, we already, you know, we were cool because again, communicative barriers are broken really just by the simple fact that we have something that that we adopt that we're, that relates, you know, to to us. Be it, be it the sports, be it, you know, the music, be it uh, again all the stuff I'm into, the game, and the comics, and all millions of different things that I'm into. I've been able to connect with people that aren't libertarian all the time, but I can plant seeds just because we already relate in that aspect. And to me, I think if the war is uh, it's sort of war, if you will, the battle of wits is gonna be won, that's where it's gonna be won, not by simply trying to think that you're gonna convince a bunch of people uh, to vote for you. They won't even do that again until you affect them from a cultural standpoint. Um, so I, that's why I think that the emphasis should be placed there. Man, uh, that was uh, comics and, in the cartoons, I mean, even surrounding the comics, that was the getaway for me. 
uh, when I wasn't being a knucklehead, when I could just kick back and like, hey, being being to comics. So the Batman's of the world, I was always intrigued by, and, I, and still, you know, it's still one of my, if not the, um, my, my, my favorite character, simply because you know, as a, as a way about him, and you know, he doesn't use, he doesn't have any sort of superpowers or anything like that. But you don't see Batman as someone that's below the Supermans of the world because you know he, he's witty, he's uh, you know technologically like savvy and stuff like. I just thought that was always to me very intriguing. Um, but it was my getaway. So you know, Batman's. And obviously, you know, growing up, I, I was what, probably what eight when the eight or nine when the Blade movie, you know, come come out, and I thought that was like Blade was the most kick ass character that I'd ever seen, man. You know what I mean? Um, and to see that in the live depiction was very cool. So obviously, they did being young then, I got into that, and obviously, a lot of the, you know, I always thought like Luke Cage was a was a very, uh, you know, Static Shock was another one that I grew up on because that cartoon was a. Uh, was out when I was so not just the print comic with the cartoon depictions and, and those man again they they have a big impact man and this is why I'm so uh, it's it's for me a dream come true to even be able to talk about some of that stuff and people actually you know care about it they actually look forward to my opinion on reviews of maybe uh, the latest comics and stuff like that because I've always been a guy that's been into that but again it was just another medium of exchange to 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 really relate to a lot of individuals and I've been able to touch a lot of people just because I t speak on things that relate in the comic sort of genre and they, they like to hear what I have to say about it. And now I grew up on that, so it's not like I have to fake it. This is what I love about my life now, is I ain't gotta fake nothing, man. Like, I'm just me, like I'm just Eric July. I do my thing, I do my music, I do, I, I, I do comics, whatever it is that I wanna do, it's just that I'm able to do that and people are, <clears throat> I'm meeting awesome people in, in those lines, doing stuff like this and talking, and, and, and this is what it's all about for me, man. I mean, Punisher, again, was one of my favorite uh, characters. Punisher is almost a perfect, which is why he's always been a hit, even with, uh, like, definitely in his print comics. He doesn't suffer from the, the same thing that maybe somebody like Captain Marvel, for example, suffers, where she's been rebooted, I don't know, seven, eight times in the last five years. Her, her, uh, because they're trying, Marvel's like trying to, hey, please like this character, right? Please like this character. But, but you don't really have to do that with Punisher. Punisher is just, in, the, in his existence, he's like the one, the one guy that says, you know what, I don't care what the laws or anything like that say, they are bad people and I'm going to get them. And I think low key, I think a lot of people will wish they could just, they could just do that or that was somebody like that. Um, because again, they're not satisfied with the justice system. So there's a lot of characters and that's where I've been able to, I think, relate to a lot of people because there are a lot of characters that definitely even just what's about them and, and, and in some of their books they have like these underlying themes that I think a lot of people enjoy but they don't extend to the logical conclusion you know what I mean it's funny I was uh I was talking about this on video about Baron, Z Baron Zemo in, in the Punisher comic ironically was saying something like uh he, he, he was uh because he's at this point in the comic living on this island or whatever this private that he's trying to get recognized as a country and he's asking I guess that's his assistant or whoever he says go get me some eggs and the assistant's like we don't got no eggs you know what I mean and he was like what do you mean and he's like well that the, the tariff that you put on those Australian uh, uh, farmers or whatever they didn't take really too kindly of that so we ran out of eggs like uh, uh, we haven't had any come in like for three weeks now and it's like oh well you know, that, the Baron Zemo just found out how, how important free trade is, right? But that, and, and, you know, people might get a kick of that, but being able to point to that and say, this is like a real thing. Like, this is, this is a real thing that actually happens in, in our world, right? And just getting them to extend it to the logical um, uh, conclusion and finding some of those underlying libertarian concepts. That, to me, is fun. That's fun. Every time I'm reading a book, I'm like, man, this... This is a really libertarian like panel right here or something like that. And I show it to everybody. And they're like, oh man, yeah, I kinda I kinda get it. So again, it's all about breaking that that communi those communicative barriers, man. And you can do that when you relate to something with other individuals. Man, it's one of the most misconstrued Bible verses that I think get read. Um, because people take that and I sh you should <sighs> It's I should be expected. It's almost like the Lord's calling this stuff, type of stuff out. You know, you, the, the people misconstrue that to mean that like every single government 
um, should be followed, right? Unfortunately, and obviously that doesn't make any sense when you can Saul or Paul or whatever you want to call him, and you know the person that wrote those letters to the Roman, he and he himself was defiant of the government. He was always in, in and out of prison. He was on the run when he was when he was going by uh, Saul, and he. You know, uh, in, in Damascus, when he he escaped, basically he was about to be executed, and he, he, they helped him escape, and that was in in itself defiant of of the government. So that doesn't mean Romans thirteen doesn't mean that follow all governments. Obviously, that's obvious. Not even just the person that wrote it, but you consider when you know Jesus had that. It was trying. Uh, excuse me. The devil was trying to convince. Uh, you know, Jesus to really essentially bow down to him and he stood over the mountaintop over all those kingdoms and he said, I could give you all of this because they were his. You know what I mean? And that in itself uh, just highlights that that particular verse does not mean, hey, follow all governments. What it means is that the only legitimate kingdom is the kingdom of God, the ones ordained by, uh, by God. Those are the only legitimate um, actual kingdoms, not that, you know, all these earthly governments, you know, those are actually the complete opposite uh, uh, quite often. You can go through, it be from the Old Testament to the New Testament, Revelations, where it talks about how all of these kings will, uh, you know, be against, you know, God and then yada. It's not a secret that these earthly governments are, are corrupt and, and, and at some point in time it's got to come crumbling down and they will meet their maker. So what that means and what Romans 13 means is that, again, the only legitimate kingdom is that of one of those that are ordained by the Lord. Not that every single government is ordained by the Lord. It's not how it works. Yeah, most definitely. What you could do as an average individual, and I think that a lot of people get discouraged because we do have these activists within our community, the ones that want to work towards a freer society, that I mean, they influence a lot of people, and they put people under the impression, fortunately, that in order to feel like you're doing something, you have to do something to the level of a guy like myself, uh, um, a guy like some of the speakers here. It's not about that. It, it, it's about utilizing what you're already a part of and using that. So again, in a lifetime, you may not influence but three people. That's okay. It's necessary just as much as it is those guys that can influence thousands of people. So just as an average individual, you're already a part of a culture. I'd actually argue that, you know, meeting at some of these events that I go to, I meet a lot of people that, are, that you wouldn't necessarily know, but they have been able to bring so many people to this movement because, again, they have their own little niche deal that they're doing. That is fine. Every single individual in this world belongs to someone unless you live in a basement. And even if you live in a basement, you're at least on the internet. So, I mean, though there are people that you are part of these subcultures, that in itself is how you, how you win. That's how you can have that influence because you have friends, you have families, you have people that relate to you. And you can talk to them, you can, you can uh, reason with them, you can plant seeds with them that otherwise other people that didn't know these guys wouldn't be able to plant because, again, they have no sort of relation to them. There's people that these top dogs will never be able to touch, but there's these, these people that are maybe, again, not a lot of people know who they are, but that doesn't mean that they are not important. So most definitely just utilize what it is that you already have at your disposal, the tools that you already have, the skills that you already have. And um, I, I know a lot of people have asked me about the music, there's a lot of music, and they're like, hey man, what how, you, you guys broke through, how did you do it? I have no, no, no problem giving these guys advice, but the, for starters, they just got to go for it. You know what I mean? Like everybody has these skills and things that they're good at. Just go for it. Like, give it a shot. Definitely in the age of social media, you can be a content creator like it's tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, just do it. Just give it a shot. See what happens. If you fail, you, you, you don't do as, you don't do that good, you, you, and you know, or you never know, you may, it may be a hit with, with a circle of people. Just go for it. Give it a shot. At this part, I'm still young. I'm only, you know, 28. But at, in the same respects, I, 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 if I'm like, hey, man, this is something I feel like I could do, I'm just going to go do it. And if it doesn't work out, it just doesn't work out. But that can apply to each and every single individual.